All right, everyone. Uh, good morning and thanks for coming to our special interest group about designing the future of the GSN. It's great to see you all here. We really want to cover three different things this morning. First, uh, Andy Frisetto will give a brief introduction to the GSN and cover some recent developments. Then I'll give a couple of updates from the perspective of the standing committee. And then I'd like to have a discussion. And so I should probably introduce myself. I'm Colleen Dalton. I'm a seismologist and associate professor at Brown University. And I'm chair of the CSN Standing Committee from IRIS. And uh, Andy Prosetto and Bob Busby, who just walked into the room, are the program managers for the GSN. And there's a couple of other people that I'll introduce in a few minutes. But yeah, what we'd like to do is kick things off with an introduction from Andy. And we're lucky this, this um, let me take my math down. This uh, thing has a virtual component. So we have a good, ooh, I'm blocking the <laughs> We have a good number of people, 27 participants who are online. So I'm hoping we'll spend the majority of the time having a discussion, a really interactive discussion, and I'll help to motivate why that's really important that we do that today. And um, yeah, I'm hoping the online people can participate too. So thanks again for coming, and I'll hand it over to Andy Frisetto. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so, uh, so I'm Andy. It's uh, it's nice to see you all. Uh, so many of you again in person. It's great to be here. I've been at Iris for about uh, 11 years, and I've been kind of a, a platoon player for uh, part of that time within instrumentation services. And now, as we'll get into, I'm I'm one of the Iris staff that's helping to uh, to manage the GSN at this point. So. Uh, what I wanted to do here was provide kind of a high-level intro to the GSN, just to make sure we're kind of all on the same page about uh, about what it is and uh, why it's so important. And then I think from there, that'll be a springboard to uh, some of the discussions that Colleen mentioned. So for starters, make sure that, okay. So uh, the Global Seismographic Network, this is, a, this is a global network of very broadband seismic stations. Roughly two thirds of it is operated by the USGS, and the other one third is operated uh, or supported by the NSF, operated by IRIS in a partnership with the University of California, San Diego. And the GSN is one of the original uh, components of the facility for NSF that IRIS has operated, all the way back to the original uh, IRIS Range Road proposal back in 1984. And there's some hallmarks of the GSN that make it uh, so important. First of all, uh, it has very broadband seismic recordings out to hundreds, thousands of seconds uh, with backup broadband and strong motion seismometers, as well as ancillary and environmental sensors. So it's really grown to be a multi-spectra, multi-modal multi uh, platform for geophysical observations. In addition to that, the operations of the GSN are very closely managed by Albuquerque Seismic Lab for the USGS and the IDA group at UCSD. And so there's a real motivation to ensure data completeness, data accuracy, and data integrity. So the data, beyond being from very good instrumentation, is also, uh, in as many cases as we can make it, complete and accurate. And it has some of the quietest seismic stations in the world. So this kind of spaghetti noodle plot is based on spectral information from about 30 GSN stations that were upgraded between 2016 and 2019. So the black line here is the median power spectra across, you know, uh, 10 hertz all the way up to 1,000 seconds for stations, horizontal components and vertical components for stations that before they were upgraded. So instrumentation that had been at in site for 20, 30 years at that point. And after the upgrades, you can see a pretty dramatic improvement in the quality of the long period seismic uh, uh, signal in particular. So it's a network that has uh, grown and improved even over its lifespan. And many of these stations have been operated for decades, as, as I mentioned. And so if you look at global real-time station uh, ages, there's a lot of global broadband stations that are available, but a lot of them are within five to 10 years uh, age of being uh, in place. Whereas the very broadband data from the GSN has been sampling the Earth system for uh, on the order of 25 to 30 years or more in most cases. And finally, the coverage of the GSN is something that's, that's particularly noteworthy. So 
Uh, one of its hallmarks is that it is uh, GSN stations are often in areas where there's no other real-time seismic data within hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. So, in fact, almost 60% of the IC networks, so those are GSN stations in China, II, which are the UCSD-operated ones with IRIS, and IU, which is USGSASL, almost 60% of those are more than 500 kilometers away from the nearest uh, other stations, and over a third are more than 1,000 kilometers. So current development. So where, where are we at in the operations of the GSN at this stage? We're catching up on lost time. So this is our first in-person meeting as a community in two and a half years. And the COVID pandemic has led to a dramatic reduction in the amount of uh, travel to station from the primary network operators at ASL and UCSD. So that has resulted in deferred maintenance. When it, we've been able to make up for some of that by working with our local partners more, but overall, after two years or more, it's beginning to impact the data return. And so the uptime of the GSN overall was down a little bit more than a percent over the last year. Uh, also, that has slowed what was a very impressive pace of upgrades to the very broadband instrument. So I had mentioned that plot where uh, about 30 stations have been upgraded between uh, 2016 and 2019. And there's been only a handful that have been able to be done over the last couple of years because of uh, travel restrictions due to the pandemic. Uh, there's a new management team. We, we said goodbye to Katrine Hafner. She took a position in a great opportunity at Lidos this spring. And so the GSN is now being managed by a team of people at IRIS uh, that are all bringing different talents and abilities to working with the community and working with our partners and operators to keep this network at a very high level of performance. Uh, we're working on the, the M word, the merger of IRIS and UNAPCO to form Earthscope and, that, and it's uh, bearing on the GSN in the future. And especially we're working to, and we'd like to, as part of events like this, work with the community to position the GSN to be a viable and sustainable element of the NSF solicitation for a future geophysical facility and what's going to go forward beyond 2025. So I just wanted to introduce uh, the management team uh, of the GSN as it is as it is currently. So uh, there's Bob Busby, the interim uh, GSN program manager. Bob, could you raise your hand? Yep. Thank you. So Bob's, he's the project lead. He's responsible for the budget, the schedule, the technical performance and execution and planning the evolution of operations of the GSN over the next few years. So there's me, Andy. Uh, I, uh, my primary role is science communication, science direction with members of the community, really trying to work with uh, our governance, both the standing committee as well as the IRIS board to figure out uh, what our future plans are gonna be and how to move forward with uh, the science vision for the GSN going forward. And then also uh, on the line, uh, helping run the webinar is Casey Adderhold. So Casey's uh, a member of the instrumentation services team at IRIS. She's worked on several different projects uh, over the last few years that you might recognize her, her from. And she's, uh, she assists with the science assessment and, and research support. And she also has connections with the, within the ocean sciences community. So trying to bring uh, more, more um, perspectives and skills to the management of the GSN. Uh, there's Molly Stats, who's the organizational and admin support. So Molly's helping us keep track of all the MOUs and permits and uh, administrative overhead of running a network that's distributed internationally. And finally, there's, there's Rob Mellers, who's uh, at UC San Diego. He's the executive director of the GSN, uh, and he's responsible for the day-in-day -day operation and maintenance of the II network and ensuring that all of the, all of the various parts that are distributed around the world, both related to uh, site activities and uh, operations of its data collection center are, uh, are well run. So I think that's the last slide I have. And yep, thanks. Thank you very much. And if there's any quick questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Uh, great summary, Andy. Just a quick question. The median or the improvement in the median noise uh, at the GSN, is that primarily due to uh, like a one-to-one -one sensor replacement, or is it due to kind of having more boreholes versus? That's a good question. I should, I should, I may, I probably knew the answer to that when I made this plot two years ago. And I should go back and, and see how many sort of vault to borehole transitions were in there, because I know there were a few. And probably if there's more than a few, it would start to have uh, a signal in there. So uh, TBD, I can probably know the answer that for sure soon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dan from the Heidegger. 
Oh, hi, Dan. Yeah. I, I could say it's mostly due to the sensory plate. Oh, okay. we, we didn't have a lot in New York. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. okay. Would you like me to bring up your slides? Yeah, okay. please. Yeah, thanks. All right. So, uh, as I said before, I'm Colleen Dalton, and I'm at Brown University, and I'm here as the chair of the Iris GSN um, Standing Committee. And you can see here on this first slide the other members of the Standing Committee, several of whom are in the room. Can you raise your hand if you're in the room? So, veteran. Um, Victor Sai, who's our liaison to the board of directors, Frederick Simons is here, some other people um, from the standing committee are online. So is it, here's a list of what I what I want to cover um, today. I want to spend most of our time on item number five. So having a discussion amongst all of us and the folks online about future directions for the GSS. Uh, and before I do that, I want to um, cover the four, first four items on the list really briefly. So uh, the first one here regards the merger of IRIS and UNAVCO. So specifically one of the um, initial foundational principles developed by the merger standing committee. This is the in-house labor principle, which was shared with the community last April, and it states a preference that core or scope activities should be performed by earth scope um, employees and that subawards will be restricted to specialized cases. So a major goal, goal of focusing on in-house uh, labor is to achieve greater flexibility and efficiency with the specialization of the staff. So as you heard from Andy, 40 of the GSN stations are operated by the IDA group at UC San Diego. They've operated these stations very successfully for a long period of time. And they do so under a subaward from IRIS. So the in-house labor principle potentially has implications for how those 40 GSN stations will be operated going forward. And my understanding is that discussions are underway to figure out how best to reconcile IDA's long history of successful operation of those stations with the new EarthScope um, in-house labor subaward principle. So I don't have much more to say about that today, but since the standing committee is something of a conduit between the community and IRIS, I, we wanted to bring that to your attention as part of the update. All right, the second issue that I want to bring your attention to is that um, NSF's long-term support of the GSN is not a sure thing. So NSF is focused on new and innovative research and the GSN facilitates all sorts of new and innovative research. But as a community, we need to be doing a better job making that case. NSF wants to know what science can only be done with the GSN, not what science is done and a GSA, GSN station is used because it happens to be there. And going forward, we need to help explain to NSF what new science could be done with continued observation at GSN stations that could not be mined from the existing data set. Um, so I have no doubt that as a community, we can make a really strong case answering both of those questions, but now is the time for us to come together and actually start um, actively promoting what, those, what that exciting science um, can be. And, that, and that's a big part of why we organized this um, SIG today and we have you gathered here this morning. NSF has stressed to us that there needs to be continued innovation of its long running facilities to support cutting edge science and to support the decadal science plan. Um, and NSF has also stressed to us that it is not designed to support long running observatories. And from certain angles, the GSN looks to them like a long running observatory. So that's not a challenge, but an opportunity. And a, a factor that makes that a little bit complicated is that it's really difficult to track how GSN data are being used for science. And uh, the GSN staff, Molly and Casey and Katrine especially, undertook 
a detailed study of uh, tracking GSN usage in publications in 11 major, major journals in our field. And they did an extensive Google Scholar search based on obvious keywords, DOIs, other things. And they came up with about 100 to 150 publications a year that use GSN data. The standing committee did a more focused search where we looked at every paper in those 11 journals over a certain period of time, several months. So we could count out whether or not GSN data were used. And we came up with about 400 publications per year for the GSN. So the GSN seems to be being undercounted in publications by a factor of three or four. And this is making it hard for us to figure out how the community is using GSN data in research, and also kind of hard for us and for IRIS and for SCOPE to demonstrate to NSF the value of this network. So if you take nothing else away from this slide, please start citing GSN data when you use it, even if you only use one hour from one station. <laughs> and if you use the DOI, that's the easiest way for it to track. Yes, there's four different DOIs for the GSN, so you have to know which <laughs> network you're using, but yes, please start getting in the habit of doing that. If you're reviewing papers, please ask that the authors have done the citations. If you're an editor or an associate editor, please oversee it from that level. If we get in the habit of a community of citing our data better, it'll make some of these things easier for us. All right, questions about any of that so far? I'll check the chat real quick just yeah. to. So is the citation as a supplement to that channel? I noticed people doing that a lot. Um, like they'll have to choose yeah. the DOI. That's a good question, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. And some, of course, some journals really limit how many papers you can cite. And so then sometimes they have to go in the supplement. But when you can cite it in your main bibliography, please do. Great. So the third item. All right. Is to review what the research community values about the GSN. We have had uh, opportunities um, over the last few years to query the community about what it finds most valuable about the GSN, and I thought we would report some of those. I'll just let you do it. Sure. <laughs> some yep. of those things to you here. You can. All right. So, of course, the longevity and continuity of the data set is tremendously important. Um, for this is scientific targets for that include any time dependent processes, and that can be very deep, like inner core rotation, or very shallow, like groundwater level changes after hurricanes. It's important for capturing rare but exceptional events, for example, great earthquakes. The repeatability of certain measurements is really useful for improving the signal to noise ratio of subtle signals, some of the small wiggles that some of us use. And of course, there are unexpected opportunities that having a long data set allows, like glacial earthquakes, ambient noise tomography, observing the Hunga Tonga eruption um, that occurred in January. The GSN is widely considered to be the gold standard for data quality. The stations are low noise, well calibrated. The sensors are very broadband, so they allow good measurements even at low frequencies. And this is important for analysis of the largest earthquakes our normal modes, of course, for these subtle signals, including looking at amplitudes for things like analysticity, and of course, other examples. Next. The global distribution of stations is critical, and our community values that the data are available freely, open access in real time. In many cases, GSN stations serve as the backbone of a temporary network or a regional network, allowing the other stations to be calibrated relative to something of high quality that, that has a, a long history. And the community values this dual operator mode that the USGS operates about two thirds of the network and NSF operates um, about uh, the other thirds of the network. It, it allows a certain flexibility in installing and maintaining GSN sensations in a wide variety of um, geographic and geopolitical situations. Many other global networks are not operated by a government agency, but are operated by a university or some other um, non-government institution. Okay. All right. So I, I put a couple of slides in here 
um, reasons why I'm facilitated by the GSN and just to sort of get the, the conversation going. One thing that the uh, Irish staff does twice a year is to provide a science update to Maggie Benoit at NSF. So <coughs> these are the recent papers and these are the exciting results for which GSN data are, are critical. So I just put a few of those into this slide show here and I don't think it'll take me too long to talk about them. Let's see. So this was one from that we that we sent to Maggie a year or so ago where uh, Wenbo Wu showed that using uh, sea phases traveling through the ocean using their travel times that can be used to track how ocean temperatures have changed over time. And in this case, a lot of the paper relied on the II GSN II station at Diego Garcia, both because of its long-term high college record, but also because of its rather remote location in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Uh, here's another paper that we shared with, with Maggie, Lucia Gualtieri and co-authors um, considered the origin of love waves in the secondary microcytism. So they showed using numerical simulations that a combination of bathymetric features, but also interaction of the wave field with 3D Earth structure were responsible for why there's a, a love wave within the secondary uh, microcytism. And the GSN stations were, were critical parts of that analysis as well, again, because of their longevity and their global distribution. And then um, finally, uh, Thomas LeCocq and many co-authors use seismic noise to change, track the changes in human activity during the pandemic uh, lockdown in 2020 and found in many places where there were lockdowns that human caused vibrations reduced by as much as 75%. 25 GSM stations were used in this study and that in certain countries, uh, China, Pakistan, and Ethiopia, for example, GSM data were the only data that were used in the study for those countries. So again, the global distribution is still useful here. All right, so now I'd like to transition to a, a really interactive group-wide discussion about future directions for the GSN. And I really we want to pick your brains. We want to know what what you think are the important science directions, um, science questions, things the GSN could do. And so to try to get that conversation going, and maybe Ved, I don't know if you want to come up here or here. Ved and I organized this session together, but uh, I've organized it into a couple of different questions that we could uh, take a look at. And, and yeah, if you guys could help me try to answer them. So the first one's on the next slide. Yeah, so this is going to be a, a really important question. I mean, this is a question that NSF has posed to us directly already, which is what is the science that can be done only with the GSM? And I started a list here um, that can get you going. Any time dependent global phenomena that couple the fluid layers and the solid earth, for example, the hum, uh, especially in the context of climate change. Studies of great earthquakes that have complex and long duration ruptures. So both the very broadband nature and the good as nuclear coverage that the GSS provides are important for that. Um, unusual events that may open up new areas of research, like the Hungatonga eruption. Analysis of earthquakes and locations lacking reasonable networks on normal modes and therefore are best constrained from density in the lower mental tomography of anisotropy and also especially on the global scale. Global CMTs, I understand, may be perceived as sort of long-term monitoring activities, but they provide first-order information about the nature of tectonics. So I'd love to hear what other questions you have, and we'll, we'll try to scribble them down. Yeah. So I would actually want to just clarification. Yes. What is the assumption that what only the GSM needs? What is the assumption that we made if NSF entered the funding Iris Bristol or GSM? What is the outcome of that? And what that I think that and you can't make this you can't make this explanation for saying this, but what could happen if NSF dropped funding? So so one of the requests we got from uh, folks in folks in the internet. Um, would be, I'm going to try to repeat the questions after they're asked just to make sure that everybody hears that. So 
Um, so folks on the webinar, the question was from Gary Pavlis, and it was basically, what's the assumption of what would happen if the NSF opted not to fund their portion of the GSN entirely or de-scoped it to some extent? My, yeah, I mean, I, I, Rick has a pen up, but, you know, my hope would be that we don't have to, we don't have to know the answer to that question. <laughs> honestly, honestly, I, I think there is, there's a really good case to be made here that the research objectives of the GSN are still first order and fundamental. And we just have gotten a little bit comfortable with those data just always being available so easily that we don't even cite them or mention them in our paper. So I'm hoping that by having discussions like this, we don't have to contemplate um, the answer to that. But Rick had his- yeah, well, well said. <laughs> I mean, fundamentally, we use unstarted search on Yeah, um, and there's no immediate discussion about all that. And I think Colleen said it very well. I think we've got ample opportunity here to re-envision, resell, reconnect the GSN in ways that we work with it and that's good. That's, that's a good session. Yeah, let's not see it as a threat. Let's see it as an opportunity. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I want to add a, something from um, the perspective of the portfolio review that was carried out on behalf of the um, uh, EAR. Um, I, yeah. We shouldn't think about this in terms of kind of the NSF deciding the, the GSN is no longer important. The GSN does not enable science that cannot be done in any other way. The point I think is that the National Science Foundation does not is not a monitoring agency, right? So for them to justify the use of funding for the GSN, which I think they fully appreciate the importance of, and if you read the portfolio review. It's like it highlights how important the GSN is overall. The idea is that we need to think about ways of adding new capabilities and innovating. And, and the way that I like to think about that is thinking about the astronomy community, which does an amazing job getting the NSF to build them brand new facilities, right? And they think about how do we, we have an amazing um, you know, telescope. We could keep it running forever. But maybe we want an even better telescope that can do other great things, right? So no, don't, don't think of it in terms of like, oh, we're running out of money, we need to be scope. But think about what could be new capabilities added to the GSN that would make it a much more compelling funding for the um, NSF. I, I hope that makes sense. I think that's the point. It's not about the GSN. It's about what the NSF does with the GSN. Right, because USGS is supposed to demonetize. Yeah. So maybe just to make sure that the discussion that just occurred is captured for, for our, our webinar friends. I think the general uh, thought here is that there's we don't want to fall into the trap of just being on, on the hook that we're doing monitoring with this, that there's many other science capabilities that the GSN could, we can think of innovating the GSN in that direction and not not getting pigeonholed. Adding new capabilities. Adding new capabilities, yep. And, and I would say, I just wanna call out, uh, Maureen Denol had a comment in the chat about, you know, NSF, there's an opportunity here to add other geophysical sensors and, and observe it, making them observatories that are beyond seismic and including shallow, uh, shallow DTS and soil moisture, GPS and, we're capable adding to their capabilities. Uh, excuse me, that's how it's more data. So I look at this list and I think this is what you can do now. So what do we want to do? I mean, isn't that the question? It's not what happens if GSN go away. GSN's not going to go away. That just won't happen. USGS might have the only GSN station that they could adopt to that. But what is missing from this list that needs to these are things that have been done and, and continue to be done. So what, what new observations are needed? And then what, what does the GSM look like to enable those? So those, I mean, so Andy, what you had mentioned, those are important for a number of fields, but even within seismology, is it, do we need more stations? Do they need to be better? Is it okay if they're not, if not as high quality? I feel like those are the questions that aren't getting answered. Maybe that's another slide. But what does the future look like? Yeah. With a better GSM. And what is the GSM? Excuse me, what, what, what is a better GSM? So folks.
folks on the webinar, that was Matt Couch commenting on on what would be needed to make the GSN within its current mission or something close to it, just a better overall scientific facility. What does it lack? Yeah, what does it lack? So I'll throw, throw it out. You've got, you highlighted that 38% of the stations don't have another station within a thousand kilometers. So is that one of the fundamental key issues? And if yes, do they have to all be current GSX quality? What if you had another 2,000 sensors and they were pretty good to my brain? Right, I guess that's the whole point of this meeting, right? Oh, it's to, 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 yeah, you know, it's a question to be, to be it's like, it's not a hypothetical, like, is that important to the community? Right, or exactly. Or is it better stations than fewer stations? Right, and, and I think, I think a, a, a standard way that these conversations have happened in my brief career is that people are like, oh, well, there's a GSM station here, let's add another type of sensor there. And it's kind of like piecemeal, and I guess it's nice to have other kinds of, you know, measurements. But but the question is, what what kinds of what kinds of like use cases would you want for the GSM? Like, what capabilities is it missing? I'll start, okay, and then like you guys can. Have. What I would love is that every GSM station has five other. Not as good stations next to it, so that we can use the ray method and really understand the signals that we're seeing. Right? That could be a DAS table wound around the, you know, away from the GSM station. It could be a bunch of, you know, even really crappy seismometers around it. It would still help, right? Because you'd be able to get the slowness information at the back end. So, but what what do you guys want? Right. Yeah, right. And and all of this, and this is exactly what we were hoping would, would happen. We want to hear these ideas and also what science, new science could you do because of that? So maybe you're thinking about better I'm trying to think about, imaging of the Earth's interior. Right, right. Like if you see a weird wiggle on a seismogram, you try to understand it. If you, when, when a 40% of your stations don't have another station within a thousand kilometers. It's really hard for you to <laughs> interpret the wiggle, right? So what if you just say you want 5,000 new stations and that's and you start with that. And you don't worry necessarily if they're broadening. But to your point, Beth, you use the GSN as the core, as the backbone, and you build out something globally that could look a lot like a U.S. array, as an example, but it's more or less permanent. And you wouldn't just put seismic, you'd probably want to put things like, like you know, pressure sensor, temperature, you've got to hit the global climate change group. And if, you, if you're down there anyway, you might as well put a pressure sensor so tsunami folks have a chance to actually look at the details. Are you I'm, I'm taking some notes. Let's see. Um, yes. Could you um, say your name? Louisa. Louisa Brahma. Uh, I'm a grad student at the um, I guess uh, really my question is, was GSN originally created to be like a permanent, a permanent network? And if we're trying to move away from monitoring, and then that's just one of the funds, like isn't a monitoring agency, how do we, with permanent stations, then how do we really uh, explain that these aren't just there collecting data for monitoring? Yeah. Like what is the purpose? Or, a permanent station usually seems like the purpose of that continuous data and monitoring purposes. Yeah, so I have a couple of responses to that. First of all, I think you're right that it's a bit of a person, there's a perception issue that it's, that it's not a monitoring network for the research community, it is for the USGS. Um, but maybe there's a perception that it is because it's, it's long running. And then I'll say a, a colleague of ours from the geodetic community gave me a nice analogy recently, which was very helpful for me, which was talking about how the geodetic community took the place boundary observatory stations that were part of EarthScope and kind of converted them into the what is it, Network of the Americas? Yeah, right. Um, and in other words, NSF committed to supporting most of those stations for another, I don't know how long, 10 years or something like that. And he told me that what helped in making that case is that, first of all, with the PBO data, they were able to demonstrate that the deformation rate is not linear. 
so that an additional 10 years of data would actually provide new information because it wasn't adequate to just extrapolate the rates that they already had from, from the previous observation. So the fact that it's a, there's a time dependent signal is a compelling case for extending the longevity of stations. And the other is that the science targets are really diverse, right? Of course, there are interesting questions to be answered about the tectonics near the plate boundary, but also there are science questions about um, environment and the atmosphere and, and climate. And so the fact that it could touch on such a broad array of questions, um, those two points he thought helped make a good case. And I thought we should think about the GSM that way a little bit, in addition to thinking about the fact that maybe the GSN doesn't have to be what it is right now, right? Maybe it doesn't have to be these 140 very broad stations that are largely similar to each other. It can be different than that. Um, yes, so let's see. You and then Rob. I want to put on something. I've been dabbling for the last several years with Frank Rude and Jim Crystal. The science when I first started to study the kind of a black hole. So to cap so just to bridge in uh, to bridge in the webinar, I think the the point that uh, Gary and, and Matt were just discussing was that there there are parts of the very broadband uh, time series that the GSN records that are not that maybe are underexploited for for useful environmental or, or earth information, and the debate is whether is that just a data mining exercise or is it is is additional data going to help make the case for continuing the GSN to look more at that area but actually I would add that like you realize you start with a hypothesis what other data can you record So there was a comment from Friedrich Simons about looking at adding uh, gravimetric sensors to GSN stations for tidal investigations. Yeah, the standing committee has been talking about exactly this topic is what, what can we do to bridge the seismic geodetic gap? Is, 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 it, is there instrumentation that we could put at some GSN stations that would help? And we've considered gravimetry, um, highway GPS, um, DAS, and tilt meters, perhaps, are all options that consider that would open up a new range of science questions. So I've switched to a new slide here and getting kind of a math question about, all right, looking forward, what new science would be enabled by continued observation at GSS stations or whatever, adding more stations, building broadband arrays that are fairly long-term, whatever you want it to be. Uh, so again, just a, a page list to get things started, studying diversity of great earthquakes. A number of great earthquakes have been observed in the last 
two decades and they are very different from each other in many ways. And so continuing to be able to observe great earthquakes um, in the detail that we can with the GSN will inevitably yield exciting science. Far field observation of US earthquakes, right? Getting out of the mutual distribution and the range of distances in any environmental application where conditions are changing over time. And of course, if we can point to examples where seismic data are useful for that, boy, that would be really compelling. Um, subtle signals, repeated observations enhance the signal to noise ratio. And again, nearby GSM species continue to be a crucial reference for other networks. So what do you think? What are other new science that, that you'd like to see us try to address? I don't really have a new science bullet, but I think that third bullet is really, really big. And just think about any kind of GSM patient near the cryosphere at the moment is seeing all kinds of new signals that they didn't see 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And so even though we don't want to be in a monitoring situation, we're actually expecting to see new signals come onto those patients that we don't understand yet, but they can maybe tell us about how that system is changing. And so to take away that baseline, you know, those new, that station is still being there is incredibly valuable for the next 50 to 100 years. And I don't think we would ever want to lose that station position for the next 50 to 100 years. So I think that if we can either expand upon that kind of coverage, especially into the northern, the southern northern part of the hemisphere, we can actually start to better understand some of those processes. That's what would change the biggest threat. So I'm just going to repeat the, the essence of that. That was Nick Schmer making the point about the importance of cryospheric observations for environmental applications uh, going forward, that that's going to become more and more relevant to understanding uh, climate change processes and other related um, activities. A similar uh, example, but for island stations, is the intensity and frequency of hurricanes or typhoons and how to recognize the a seismic signature of those. Some of the uh, hurricanes produce uh, strong midwater uh, plumes of debris, which we don't really understand what the statistical cause of that, but it has a signature in the seismic record, and the seismic record extends back beyond the satellite uh, observation. And, and if we go forward uh, with more understanding if there are additional, say, pressure sensors or deep water uh, augmenting the island. Ways to get at important climatic questions. Yeah, this has sort of already been said, but um, in, in studying all of these different things, as we're moving more and more towards using full waveform data um, and making use of all parts of the, both the frequency band and, and, and everything that comes with it, I think it'll be important that we have all this very high quality data. If we don't have the quality of the data needed to distinguish between all these different sources, all these different contributions to the seismic signal, then we're not going to be able to answer the question. Okay. Another question shows the longer period, the higher frequency, or more intensity, or more frequency. How do you take that? Um, I mean, I would say you, you want all of those things. <laughs> density would help. Uh, depending on what sources you're interested in, potentially you want longer periods, potentially you want higher frequency. Depends on physical properties. Give your hand up. I just had um, a comment about whether we want to go in the direction of more quote unquote low quality data stations versus more better coverage outputting existing stations with more and more and more diversity like a better than GPS. And if we hold the former, I am worried that it will have a tendency to um, the sensitivity to longer period data. Um, lots the low quality instruments don't have the have the longer period. So some of the scientific questions that you're I don't know if that would be temporary deployment of uh, stations with the full view of the GSM or whether it falls under that category. 
Intel or some other uh, industry. Um, so I have a long period at Monsters. I would be more comfortable uh, having more So I'm going to repeat that one for the for the webinar folks. Uh, so that that was uh, Raj Malik from Princeton, I think you said. Uh, I think the general takeaway was that there's concern if you're going to a, a more distributed uh, station model for the GSM with maybe not high quality stations, is you're going to start to progressively lose resolution with longer period signals and maybe uh, maybe lose some of what is making uh, the GSN so high performing. Could, could I ask you that if you're if you know that you're going to uh, ask a question or maybe engage in a comment, would people be willing to come up and kind of this is the polycom, which is sort of the bridge to to the internet, uh, and will help I think people uh, feel a little bit more engaged uh, on the far side. I know we're trying to do two things here, uh, and I just want to try to make sure that we can help those people feel uh, as bridged in as they can. <laughs> I, I I don't even want to know <laughs> how that's going to work. That wouldn't work. Yeah. I think your idea is to get in. Yeah. Are, are there prices from those? So so there's been so you can see them. Uh, they're they're uh, scrolling through here. Both both those and uh, and uh, uh, Casey's uh, uh, pleased to be better bridged in. So. Uh, one was from uh, Maureen, who makes the point about uh, the uh, stations that have already been used for glaciology research, and can can see it there. Um, Nobody can read it from this. Okay, <laughs> I can barely read it on my screen, and it's right here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's the point. That, actually, it's from uh, uh, Brad Lepofsky, but um, I think it's that to lose some of the coverage in some of these areas, which are which are already kind of limited in their station sampling would be um, a real loss. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, let's not think about losing coverage. Think about what you want to be able to do. Okay. Yeah, come on up. Yep. And introduce yourself and, uh, yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Tim Melbourne from Central Washington University. And, um, what just got said is true. We shouldn't think about loss of coverage, but the fact is it's not an infinite pool of funding. And speaking from the Cascadia standpoint, where we have a very periodic signal whose characteristics we know a lot about, what we've found over the last 20 years is when you start throwing a lot of instrumentation, so strain meters, uh, long baseline tilt meters, high rate GNSS, broadband seismic, short period seismic, the bills go up. And what I have found personally is the loss of spatial coverage because you're putting so much reference, so, so many resources into putting so many instruments at a given point, you end up losing spatial coverage. And the loss to the science of the loss of the spatial coverage is not, unless you're very lucky, outweighed by the myriad of different measurements you could make at a given point. And with Cascadia, we can get away with it because we know, hey, it's, we know the next DTS is coming through Northern Washington, you know, February of 2023 or whatever. But when I go out and download GSN data, the idea that I could get a borehole strain meter or, uh, or even GPS, which is kind of what I do mostly these days, and grab all these multi-component uh, uh, measurements from a given station, but know that I can't get all these other stations because they don't exist. Um, that's not, I wouldn't recommend just from my own experience making that trade. And it's not an infinite pool of funding. So it is a zero sum game at some level. So I just wanted to say that because everybody tends to say, well, we want everything at every place all the time. And that's just not how it works if you're not in Navy, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Marine seismic. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Hey, I'd like to yeah pivot maybe put, building a little on Tim's point and also you know providing a bit of a counterpoint to Raj's point and I, I don't disagree with anything that you said Raj about losing about the very long period signals but you know in thinking about our ability to image the deeper and then thinking about the set of science questions that we think about um, you know related to deep earth imaging you know lower mantle core mantle boundary we're often very limited by our ray path coverage, which is controlled in large part by where the stations are. And I look at the GSN map. There are, you know, Matt, you made this point too. There are 
huge holes on that map. And I, I think it might sound a little incremental to suggest plugging some holes on that map, but I, I don't think the science would be incremental. I think it sounds a little incremental in talking about the technical um, capability, but I actually think we could make a case that the science gain, particularly as when it pertains to deep earth imaging, would not be incremental. So I kind of, even if it might come at the cost of, well, okay, maybe they're, you know, vaults or maybe they're broadband stations instead of very broadband stations. I mean, I'd, I'd make a case for the science that we could do by plugging some of the holes on that map. Yeah, new path. If you, if you can, Matt, I appreciate it. Keep as much uh, close to this as we can. Thank you. Yeah, so Matt's out smart data. So I totally agree with Maureen. And then the question is, what's the number? What's the aspirational number? Is it 500 kilometer spacing everywhere? Is it 300? Is it 750? I mean, like I, that's why I, when I suggested 5,000, that's not, that sounds crazy. But before we did US Array, 2,000 sounded crazy, right? So, so why not pick a number and shoot for it? And if you don't quite get there, that's okay. You gotta so, start somewhere. So maybe just to read another a comment that's just come in. So this is from Weeson Chen, and and Weeson makes the point that we're looking for areas where we can increase coverage in in unique areas where maybe there's not been a lot of historic sampling. In Antarctica, with with the growth of research bases there, that might be a, a leverageable asset, something where you don't have to deploy a station totally on its own. And, and I would maybe build off that and just say, I think another thing that we, we sometimes think about on the facility side is, is optimization. Maybe there, are, maybe there are areas in the GSN where you have a low performing station or you have station coverage just due to other networks that's, that's good enough and you can move it on on the map to plug a hole someplace else without having to get significantly more funding. So there, there may be at this stage, we know enough to make some, to make some calls on what to do there. All right, Frederick Simons, I'm just here to agree with what you just said, which I didn't know you were going to say, is that you may, you may <laughs> want to take out some stations that really don't need to be there because they're in very, very industrialized nations that can take care of them and then rather swap them for something where you haven't been. Uh, and we've been talking about the ocean, but we haven't really talked about going underwater that much, right? If you say ocean bottom pressure sensors, you're underwater. If you're near islands or in the deep oceans, you know, the GSN for the ocean, I know that's an order of magnitude different cost, but that's where the holes are in our in our past coverage. And so would you want to take out a British station and a Canadian station and like, you know, go somewhere in the deep ocean? This, is, this should be on our discussion. Thank you. Uh, maybe while we're, can they hear me when I talk? I, I think so, okay. yeah. Um, Maybe while we're on the ocean thing, we can think about whether that the model that we think about in terms of the GSM being a permanent installation that involves partnerships that are international, which by the way, may get more difficult as the world kind of spirals into disaster. Um, <laughs> should, we, should we think about other models like repeat occupation models where you put an OBS down every two years in the same location, right? So you have long-term recording but it's not the same station, right? Is that acceptable? I mean, there are problems with it, right? It's not going to be identical. But are these are these costs worth the benefits? I guess. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another concept called smart cables, which is to put uh, sensors in subsea fiber cables. And um, I mean, this is self-serving because we're working on this, but, but the whole point is that we've got about 1.2 million kilometers of cable on the seafloor right now. There's about 20,000 repeaters, and those are getting refreshed every year, usually by Meta and Google and a few other groups. But if you even had 10% you know, of those with sensors, you would fundamentally change the coverage. If you look at the cable map, there's a lot of places that you still don't cover the Central Pacific and Southern Pacific, and those will be kind of difficult. But there are other opportunities to piggyback with other groups that are working on those things. And there's groups like NOAA who's very interested in this because it's all about tsunami warning for them. So, so it's partly about smart cables, but also advocating for um, who, who's not being um, talked to right now. 
about any of these things, right? When you get to the glaciology, for instance, you know, where some of us might be doing that research, but there's also specialists that, that aren't even aware that this conversation is going on and they may have fundamental contributions. Um, as Frederick Simon again, I just want to add to that point that I, I'm not involved in smart cable, but I think that is the closest to what a GSN for the ocean would look like, right? And it's not dock cables, it's not distributed acoustic sensing, it's rather having a real instrument at places between cables that then get replaced to act like the closest thing to its global size network, but G really meaning global, including the ocean. So that should be on our agenda. Here's a comment from Rachel Abercrombie that I'll, I'll just repeat. So uh, Rachel's point would be that in areas where we do get some improvement to coverage by filling in island stations, uh, there might be some still issues because they're noisy and that limits resolution. And so adding to that with um, either small arrays would have a major effect on improving data quality, maybe in areas where it's the best you're gonna get without ocean coverage. Oh, yeah. There are reports on this, right? Yeah. We've been talking about the effect in the ocean for a while. 50 right. years? <laughs> Since the 80s. Sure. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so, so this is something that you've all brought up several times already, but are there new capabilities that could be added to the GSN that build on its strength? And that could be the fact that station infrastructure, telemetry power already exists at these stations, or it could be the technical expertise of the staff. Um, but yeah, are there new capabilities? And almost all of these you've already mentioned. We could relocate some stations. There is some Redundancy, often the redundancy is very, very inexpensive, so it's not great cost savings, but there's some redundancy. And as, as Maureen said, some new stations would allow new paths for structure studies. The earthquakes are going to be in the same places, but we could put the stations in the places. Uh, instrumentation that bridges the seismic geodetic frequency gap. Other instrumentation, uh, standing committee, for example, has discussed having more infrasound sensors and the opportunities there for atmospheric science, but also for understanding geophysical sources, long-term broadband arrays, which Ben mentioned. These are arrays that would be installed and operated by the facility, um, not by PIs. They don't have to be permanent, but they would be longer term and they'd be operated more in a mode like the transportable array is operated. Sea floor stations. It's a good case to be made for all of these things. Other ideas? Oh, Do you want to come up, Raj? Up. Thank you. I can tell you it's much appreciated on the other end. They can hear us much better now. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in knowing if anybody in the audience has looked at co-located gravimeters and seismometers and GPS stations. And um, I know I did a very preliminary kind of check, and there are very few of them, um, hybrid GPS gravimeters and seismometers. Uh, so the Japanese have the GeoNet and FNet, which are kind of, I mean, they're not co-located, but they're close enough. Um, but I think there is some merit in having that kind of setup because you can get certain uh, measurement attributes that you can't get from a seismometer, uh, especially like absolute gravity or, you know, uh, the gravimeters tend to give a really good signal at the longest period. So. Yeah, so I, maybe that is something that I wanted to point out that you know co-located measure uh, instruments have some merit. Thanks. 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 Um, hi, it's Frederick Simons. I just thought of something that I hadn't thought about before, but um, there's large corporations that build cell phone towers in places like American Tower Corporation, and they have power and they have telemetry because that's their business. And especially when we think about Africa, which also is you know, somewhat underserved by global seismic network stations, if you're looking for sites, I'd go find the cell phone towers and partner possibly with some of these corporations 
These are not probably noisy sites, but they're, they're guarded sites because they typically have a guard next to the tower. Otherwise, all the infrastructure would be you know, at risk. And they're all very well sited. And, and there's thousands of these towers available. I doubt that there's any TSN station near a tower, but that could be a, a cost sharing or a, clearly would help with the budget of siting. So there's a couple of players in that area. American Tower Corporation is one of them. John Orcott wrote, the newest people stations are able to record and telemeter data for nearly three years. The biggest problem is the cost of ships. The construction of an autonomous ship or two would greatly reduce the cost in the long run. Oh, Maureen's coming. Oh, yeah. Quickly, this is not something uh, Maureen Long from Yale University. I just wanted to kind of do a plus one on what you said, said about um, the potential for doing arrays around some of these stations. So just echo, I, I think that that, again, like in thinking about science gain, um, ability to do, you know, back azimuth and slowness information and to do some, you know, SNR enhancement with stacking. Like, I think that and and as you said, you wouldn't need an array necessarily of like super. You could do right. You could maybe even do short periods. You could do vault broadband. Like I think that's an, another example of a of a thing that would be you know fairly simple. And maybe you couldn't do it everywhere, but but the potential for the increased science yield I think would be really high. So just a plus one for for that um, that kind of model. Well, and one thing that we've talked about, the standing committee has talked about, is putting one of those arrays um, somewhere where there is a gap, yeah. right? So you could kind of check two boxes at the same time, yeah. something like that, yeah. where you could have an array, and it could be somewhere where there currently is a gap in the, in the station coverage. Yeah. So you, yeah. I love it. Okay. All right, next slide. Let's see. So my next slide is... Um, are there changes that would, oh, Bob, go ahead. Bob, did you want to say, yeah. I just have one suggestion on uh, capabilities. It's not instrumentation actually, but it's quality control and moving us from the sort of uh, figurative association of a gold standard of the seismic data <clears throat> to one that's literal and quantitative. So using actual things like the Princeton synthetics to compare the recorded uh, signal with the synthetic and actually do a quantitative determination of how good is the quality of that uh, earthquake record. This serves several purposes. It improves the, the data selection, so you can choose which data you want if it meets certain quality standards. This is something that DS is working on and for research-ready data sets, but you need an actual algorithm to, to quantitatively measure the quality. It serves a second purpose um, to improve the station. The performance of the stations will improve if the operators know something is wrong. And the third thing, which I think is most important for the GSN, is that you can encourage other countries, contributors to share data and actually tag that data with a quality, quantitative quality indicator. And so people will aspire to high quality data delivery and NSF itself doesn't have to pay for that additional stations. They come and, and contribute to the overall thing, but we have to add the capability of monitoring the quality over time. So. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I really like that idea of expanding the GSN by defining what is a GSN caliber station right. and then looking at the existing stations to see what, what fits. Brandon? This is Brandon Schmant from University of New Mexico. Um, I'd kind of build on that a little. Like, do we know enough about our GSN sites now for um, some of these environmental change links to climate change kind of applications? Do we know the depth to weathered or unweathered bedrock, the depth to the water table, the near surface velocities? Like, if we're going to interpret these really small changes in um, the seismic wave field, whether it's amplitude or phase. If that didn't have to be an unknown, if all those things didn't have to be unknown at the site, maybe we could be picking up on even subtler signals and extending those back in time um, too and, and leveraging the, the longevity of um, 
of the GSN. So, so maybe we'd be even better at some of these environmental applications if we knew, you know, in great detail about the site. And that sort of plays on the, the quality control, but also on the thought of arrays. Maybe arrays near the site don't have to be forever, but at times you learn a lot about the site. Maybe you need to revisit it. But um, if these are really special observatories, maybe we need to know in even greater detail about the little parcel of Earth beneath them. And that's what you need to know to know how seriously to take the comparison with the synthetics, right? Because if you don't know the local structure, the synthetics don't capture the local structure. This is, but we don't we don't do that. There's no catalog of near surface GSM structure as far as I'm aware of. What? Well, there's VS30. Need better than VS30. Yes. Every GSM Right. And we have receiver functions probably at every. Uh, GSM stations, they're just never compiled, right? Next. Okay, so are there changes that would evolve the GSM toward lower cost? Do you want to step while well, increasing data availability and quality? Uh, and, and this is maybe fairly technical at this point and, and not so much directly related to the science, but Essentially, if we didn't have, if, we, if the operators didn't have to visit these stations so often, uh, they would be cheaper to operate, and we could do more stuff with the same amount of um, money. So, yeah, and a lot of the station issues because the sensors have recently been upgraded. My understanding is that uh, most of the station issues, data availability issues that are experiencing in the last couple of years, are actually related to issues of power or communications and not so much the sensor itself. So there's opportunity there to make those stations more resilient. Uh, forgive me, I don't know the answer to what may be a very basic question, but are there any land-based GSN stations that don't already have GNSS co-located, not just for timing, but for actually positioning? That's not a lot of data and the actual that instrument isn't very expensive is it are they all co-located at this point they're not no. okay, so that would be a addressing that earlier issue that would be a very it's not a huge amount of data if you don't do very high rate which you don't need to for big earthquakes yeah and, and these receivers aren't very expensive anymore yeah. so for maybe a few thousand dollars per station and a few hundred bytes per second you could add a lot. I have a short comment. It's more of a technological thing for the Dictionary University of Maryland. So the, the question about comms at a lot of the stations right now is we're relying upon either you know data upload to like a telephone server or whatever, some sort of dial up or internet if you have access at the site, but like satellite communications have been overly expensive and I hate to say this, but it's changing rapidly right now. The ability to have telecommunications at really remote sites is becoming more and more available as these companies start putting up all these communication satellites. I think Starlink is the, the current one that's out there. If you look at the coverage for that, it's ridiculous. Everywhere is below certain latitudes. Um, and the reason why that's happening is that people see a market there, which I think we can take advantage of, I think, in this community. And so that will bring down our data cost significantly. So sites that are remote, won't be quite as expensive as they used to be. I think that's something that's an important point to make. Okay, thank you. Just to add to that, uh, three days ago, my family just took delivery for the total of $600, a Starlink Dishy 2 antenna, and it's 120 bucks a month uh, for the RV package. So we can put this in the van and you know, drive around. And it's uh, we tested it and we got 220 mega bits per second, which blows away my home ISP by what, a factor 15, 100 bucks a month. But now your kids will never get off the internet. Well, that's <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. 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 So maybe an opportunity just to highlight a, a couple uh, comments that have come in. So uh, Jung Hyung Park has uh, made the point that it would be important to upgrade um, 
to infrasound arrays were capable, considering how important they were in resolving, uh, for instance, the recent Hunga Tonga event. Um, and uh, Rob Mellers made the point that EARS, which is a receiver function repository at IRIS, should have at least that level of, of near side structure for the GSN. And then Rob makes the point as, as, as the II network operator that there has been a sensor failure component of um, recent visits for the GSN. So that, that is still a playing factor, particularly in stations that haven't been upgraded yet. Rodent. Yeah. <laughs> the Always. The greatest nemesis. <laughs> the cat that makes sure. Okay. So since we have about 15 minutes left, what I have here is straw man scenarios, a kind of random number of them, but just different uh, different models for what the GSN could look like in 10 years, just to stimulate some discussion. So one model is the NSF-USGS partnership continues but the responsibilities get distributed differently. So maybe the USGS um, leads on station operations and the monitoring work that they're already doing, and the NSF leads on innovation, um, like data quality and improving research capability. So it's still a partnership, but right now the partnership is like two partners that are doing the same things in parallel, but for, for different stations. One could imagine dividing up the work differently in a way that ser continues to serve the two missions. The second one here is thinking of the GSN as a facility installed and a facility operated geophysical network that balances longevity with some versatility. And, and we're hearing a lot of that today, that, that the longevity is important, but maybe we don't need 50 years of data from 140 stations, right? Maybe we could do with longevity at a smaller number of stations and then be more versatile with other operations, like having temporary broadband arrays in some places, or having diverse instrumentation at some stations, but doesn't have to be at all um, stations. So kind of thinking about the GSN more as a geophysical network. Uh, I think someone already even suggested this, but a streamlined continental footprint, so less redundancy, bigger international contribution, station operations, more resilient stations, and a bigger presence in, in the ocean somehow. Um, and then there is a scenario here where there's a smaller GSN focused mostly on Earth-based monitoring that's operated entirely by the USGS. That that's we're we're not going to worry about that um, today, right? So that's that's just if we make a really compelling case for the science, we won't have to worry about it. That's, yeah. that's what happens if we don't. If we don't, yeah. Thoughts about any of these scenarios or other scenarios? Come on up, Raj. Yeah. You would have picked a different seat if you know <laughs> that we were going to make you do this, right? <laughs> um, so I was wondering what the first point there and whether the uh, senior members in the audience and or the standing committee have thought about what implications that has when we are talking when we're trying to get the network in other countries which are traditionally not part of the network what does it uh, imply because a lot of the other some of the other networks are operated by institutions right so does will that have a negative effect on how wide our scope can be in terms of countries if all this, yes, right. I, I think you're getting at the fact that maybe right now there's an advantage for some stations, but they're not operated by a government agency. Is that what you're getting at? And, and this scenario was that. No, we we have not discussed this in um, detail. I don't. Do you want to? No. I mean, I guess the only thing I, I I can add to that is that from having served on the GSM standing committee, you know, several years ago, and then again now. Like the negotiations for some of these international station installations are still ongoing. Like this is like seven years later, right? Like the Uzbeks and the Tajiks and whatever. Like these things 
these are really hard and yeah there's probably it's like easier for certain entities to do it than other entities so that's definitely something we should think about uh, in terms of what makes a, a, a network i guess easy to make to 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 operate and, and more versatile but also developing these arrangements with foreign institutions that are willing to install to host and provide support for a GSM station on long term is tough, right? So maybe, I mean, it's easier to just drop something off the side of a ship and just like come back, you know, later. You don't have to negotiate with other entities. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, okay. You have to negotiate with worry about exclusive economic zones for every country that we like to do. Sure, sure, sure. But I guess if you're filling GSM gaps, you can, you can be an international. But anyway, th these are the kinds of considerations that are really weird because we as scientists don't think about them, right? Because it's like someone else's problem. <laughs> <laughs> are you looking at me? <laughs> Hi, uh, Frederick Simon. I, I know we're not taking a vote here possibly, but I, I like three plus two, you know? Streamlined continental footprint also going into the ocean and then having to still be installed by the facility and visited with temporary deployments to do the site characterization that we talked about or all sorts of other, you know, array, even temporary things. And, you know, the seafloor is a, is a smart cable solution and there are temporary deployments around that could be used for that sort of site characterization with OBSs or with more exotic floating hydrophones and things like that. And two plus three would work. You want to take the vote on number four? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Felt in the interest of transparency, we should put it up there. But these are just to get the conversation going. Right. Like, yeah. right. You guys should come up with five and six and seven, right? Well, it's like bigger. Uh, like I said, I'm Dan from the, from the Ida Group. I just want to make one comment about the, the financial piece. As far as streamlining, uh, I think we got to be careful about mixing up um, the cost of an op op ongoing operation of a station with the capitalization cost of, of new stations. So you can't trade like one station for one station. You can't build a new station. I mean, unless you're talking about timelines of, you know, timelines of 20 years or so, the cost of, you know, okay, we can swap some maybe redundant stations, three redundant stations for, for, for three new stations. That's not going to save you any money. You're going to have to still come up with a lot more money, maybe in order of magnitude, if not more, to, to build out new stations. So the ongoing costs are much less than, than new capitalization costs. So I think that's the question. Spend more money to improve the network and actually move stations to where you need. Why not spend more money? This is the science. So just just to repeat that, that was that was Bob Busby responding to Dan's comment on on the concept of it might be okay to spend more money if you're improving the network. If it's really serving a, a science goal, then that might be justifiable. And, and this, uh, just to add to that, there's a discretization problem here, right? Like the, the operators are really efficient. So like one staff member, you can't just like cut one station and say, oh, I saved like 3% because like one staff member like might be helping with, with 20 stations operations, right? And you can't just like cut off their finger and say like, oh, wow, I saved money now, right? So it's like, we can cut the GSN by 20 stations and maybe save some money, but like, you know, shuffling around by a couple of stations here and there won't really do anything. Uh, just to read Rachel's comment, uh, so Rachel probably made the point um, rolling off the top. Just that there, not to get, again, I think stuck in the nomenclature of earthquake monitoring, there's also earthquake science where you're learning fundamental things that will contribute to monitoring, but it's not just making a catalog. Really good. Any other so Dave is the operator for the USGS stations. I agree with Dan, the most expensive stations are the most remote. Getting rid of stations in dense coverage areas such as the US doesn't save much money because they are cheap already. 
and I think Lisa and Jenna made the point just above that about uh, favoring uh, uh, adding on ice stations. <laughs> All right, so I know we're getting close to the end here, and I um, like one previous one. So I skipped one slide before that. This one? Yeah. yeah. So while I have you here, this has been fantastic from, from our point of view as a way of getting real time feedback from the community. And we'd like to keep up this level of engagement or even expand this level of engagement with the community. So how do we do that? What is a good way for us to reach you and your colleagues? Are bulk mail announcements effective? Um, what, what, what gets our email seen? What gets our communication seen? Frederick. I still read email. <laughs> so Frederick still reads email. Yeah, <laughs> same. Oh. Your people read email and engage social media to get the word out. Yeah, you could put on social media that an email went out. But maybe even just saying that the GSN training committee would love to like get paragraphs if you have an idea that you want to pitch. You know, it's not like there's like a you know a cabal of people who have like some agenda about how they want this to run, right. right? Like the whole point of having community oversight of the GSN is to make the GSN as useful and as powerful scientifically as it can be. But I, I certainly never emailed anyone on the GSN committee with like, I wish there was this, <laughs> but you should. Yes, you should. This is this is maybe kind of an old school concept, but when is the last time that there was a dedicated science session at a meeting like SSA or AGU on the GSN, just to talk about, you know, be, be a collect collecting point for maybe what people are currently working on. Yeah. yeah. Or you could do a, a webinar where the highlight for every six months is the first part, maybe that discussion, and then the second part is. What's new and what's engaging about the internet, just as a temporary six months virtual thing. You know, and then, and then one thing that's, that's gone away are these one pagers. And a lot of you probably don't even know what they are, but when I was in grad school, when it was time for Iris to write a proposal, everyone wrote these one page things about how they're using Iris the facility, the data. For their, their research, and then they all got compiled into a big binder that got passed on to NSF. And that was probably, I was never on the receiving end of that, but I imagine that was a really good way to understand how the community at large was doing science with Iris uh, facilities. So I I don't know that there's a need to introduce that, con reintroduce that concept overall, but something like that is needed, I think, where there's this two way communication between the community and the facilities about, about science. No, we really love GSM one features, that's for sure. All right, well, if there's nothing else, we're pretty much right at, at time. So thanks to Andy for making this happen and to Ben for suggesting it in the first place. And thanks to all of you for coming and making the suggestions. Thank you. All. Thank you everyone on the webinar who stuck oh, with okay. us. Uh, we really appreciate your engagement and uh, we, we have your, your comments and your questions uh, archived. So if there's any follow-ups, we'll, we'll get in touch. But thank you again. Thank you.